Welcome, folks, to our uh, May 9th edition of the uh, of the Local History Guild. Uh, it's good to be here. This is a this is an interesting program tonight. Um, we have uh, we have uh, Evan O'Brien here from the Boston Tea Party Shipton Museum, and uh, he's going to be talking about the uh, you know the anniversary of the affair of the tea uh, in Boston Harbor. And we also have uh, Professor uh, Bruce Brunton uh, from James Madison University. Uh, he's an economics professor and. Uh, and he graciously agreed to to uh, to join the the program to talk about the the East India Company and and um, I think this is a really important part of the story uh, the um, because uh, as virtually all of you know um, you know my perspective on on life is pretty much mar maritime in its uh, you know in the understanding of the structures of American history. I think the maritime aspects uh, of American history are very, very important. And in the colonial era, they, they are really, really important. The, you know, the whole, the whole idea of the Boston Tea Party itself, the affair of the tea, the destruction of the tea is fundamentally maritime in every way, shape and form. So the, the, the tea itself didn't just arrive it's like, like some random thing. It came from China, and it came from China via sea, and it came from China via via uh, competition uh, between not just uh, not just you know the different nations, but but different uh, different trade organizations within nations, and you know creating an entire uh, uh, structure of global trade that took place in ships. On sea, uh, with uh, uh, with ultimately, you know, with with markets, of course, being the the ultimate goal, and um, and you know, the, the the American colonial experience is actually it, it's such a hilarious. I mean, it's it's kind of hilarious, you know, actually when you when you really think about uh, from from our our perspective of you know Americans today, fancy being colonials and everything that that what that means. What that means is that. You make stuff for the other guy. The other guys are, are in control of the economics, and you catch fish and cut timber and um, and boil out whale oil and uh, dig mine, you know, dig dig coal and um, you know make iron, and you do you know the sorts of you do the the, the commodity stuff that that the other guys are going to then make you know uh, make into products for 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 you to buy, uh, essentially. Um, the problem, of course, with all of this is war. War, it's constant. And, you know, these gigantic ships of the line that made up, you know, Her Majesty's Navy, His Majesty's Navy, these things are enormous, enormously expensive. Uh, and um, and where are you going to get the timber? And where are you going get, to get, get the people? And how are you going to pay for all this? Uh, and, you know, you pay for it by... Um, by beating up on your colonists as much as humanly possible and taking all their timber to boot. So, um, you know, it, it, there's some real, uh, there are some really interesting ideas behind, you know, the, the big picture of, of the American colonial experience that, you know, we're going to delve into tonight. And um, uh, so that that's sort of my intro. Um, what do you, what do you say, Professor Brunton, did your did your PowerPoint come back or are you going to talk? No, I can't seem to get that to load onto this lap. That's all right. Yeah, it just doesn't seem to be coming up on my laptop, but um, I'm glad to take over and run through what I was going to talk about if you're ready. By, by all means, you know, I, I, I'm really, I think it's really important listening to, to what you have to say about that. Well, the, um, the East India Company uh, is, is, you know, famous for being one of the most powerful companies in world history. Uh, its longevity goes back, uh, well, it lasted 270 years, roughly. Um, and if I, I wish I had my PowerPoint uh, slides here because I was going to show you that the, there's actually a, a, a recent rein, reinvigoration of the East India Company. Uh, it, the, the, there is currently somebody, an Indian entrepreneur, in a twist of fate, uh, bought the property rights to the name of the East India Company 
uh, and sells luxury teas and coffees and chocolates and stuff. If you go to their website right now, the eastindiacompany.com, you can buy King Charles III commemorative coins or, or a black tea caddy for loose black tea. Uh, so tea, again, you know, runs through. So anyway, let me give you a history of the, of the East India Company. I'll give kind of a brief timeline overview. Then I want to talk a little bit about mercantilism as a system, and then a little bit about uh, the last, say, two decades before the Tea Act to kind of get an idea where the East India Company was prior to the Act. So the company was originally chartered by Queen Elizabeth in 1600. There had been a few other, as you know, Michael, I read your, your piece, a few other um, trading companies that had been launched prior to 1600, the Muscovy Company, the Levant Company, and so forth, um, in efforts to gain some of the trading wealth that really the Portuguese and the Spanish had had dominated. But the, the first East India Company charter was for 15 years uh, in, six, in, in 1615 years, and it was for all trade east of the Cape of Good Hope. That is a huge area. <laughs> so the put and all trade, not just tea, everything. So potentially this is a huge a business. The original um, format for the company was, as not uncommon for other companies at that time, was for investors to invest in, in a specific voyage, not the company as a whole. Uh, individual enterprise. And you know, the returns on those were all over the place, uh, depending on the success of the voyage. In 1657, uh, 60 years later, roughly, uh, and this is when Cromwell was in charge, they changed the format of the company to be a more traditional joint stock company, which is what you would think of as, as a modern corporation or a modern company. Uh, but the real, uh, the real gains in um, in political power and, and, and in some sense economic wealth for the company came in the 1670s. And that's when Charles II um, took the throne. Really, is a period of years here. It's about five different acts that Charles passed. He married uh, the Portuguese princess, Catherine, I forgot her last name was. She's the one who pushed tea drinking in, Eng in England. She's the, the big advocate of tea drinking. Before that, apparently, tea wasn't a popular drink, believe it or not, in, in India. But what Charles uh, uh, awarded to the company uh, were the rights to have to print their own money, to acquire territory, to form armies, uh, to, you know, really to operate as a country, to make war and peace, to enact criminal codes, to have jurisdiction over any areas that they acquired. And this is where the company gains its sort of unique, almost government-like uh, powers in the 1670s. What had happened in, this, in the 17th century that was in the basis of the story really, is that tea, uh, had, tea was only produced in China until the 1800s. The East India Company uh, smuggled out of China tea plants and planted them in India. And the next, by the mid 1800s, tea in India would end up uh, being a grown and eventually dominate tea production. But in this era, it came only from China. The problem for the East India Company was that British exports uh, were not very interesting. Chinese weren't so interested in woolens, and that's about all they had to sell. Uh, in, in, the, in the early mid 1600s. So if you wanted to buy a tea from the Chinese, you needed silver. So this is inconsistent with mercantilist policy, which is you wanna maximize gold and silver inflows to the countries. Outflow is not a good thing. This is really where the mid 1640s, 1690 English success, I think in the East India Company's case, came from their ability to gain footholds in India to build what at the time were referred to as factories, uh, but they're really sort of trading centers. It's sort of a combination of a, a farmer's market and, uh, and some manufacturing by, within walls. So locals brought their stuff in and traded, but they also hired people to produce in particular in India textiles. 
uh, which will over time become more and more popular. So textiles were something, and also the English got, uh, the East India Company got a few spices to be grown in India, pepper, for example, so that they could, because they really couldn't get a, a, a dominant hold over the spice trade. The Dutch mastered that uh, for a variety of reasons. They were very efficient traders in the six, 17th century um, and had the political control and land control over some of the key areas. Um, the, the, the other dynamic, uh, as time goes on, we're moving into the 1700s, as sort of twofold. Um, to, in order to expand the tea trade, the British uh, or East uh, English East India Company, they're kind of, it's, it's, the semantics are a little, a little uh, confusing. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland doesn't emerge until the 1700s. So early on, it's the English East India Company, then later it's the British East India Company. It doesn't really matter, we'll just call it the East India Company. Um, there's, as you can imagine, a very wealthy uh, company who has a unique monopoly. Uh, everyone else wants the same privilege. So there's constant battles in, in England, uh, the parliamentary uh, advocates of other companies who want to get their you know, share of the action. That's ongoing. So they've got to fight that. So this business government interrelationship is in and of itself a, a very interesting, both probably business management case study and and geopolitical case study. But um, so that's one dynamic, maintaining their monopoly by lobbying and spending money to, to curry favor, and then expanding the trade with China by coming up with increasing trade options. Ultimately, this leads to India producing opium for the Chinese to sell their tea. And of course, that led to the opium wars and a variety of other uh, uh, unusual um, you know, obviously the opium wars in the, in the 1800s. The, um, the key major final, I think, success of the East India Company came in the 1750s when they actually had to battle with the French a little bit and, and took huge swaths of India under control. And that led to enormous wealth in the 1750s and 60s from land rents, taxation, um, the, the, the Indian, the army that the East India Company had, 260,000, was larger than the British Army. And they sold their services to local rulers for a fee, kind of like the Wagner Group, perhaps, in Russia. I don't know. Maybe that, not that. But there were some morally corrupt issues here. But it was a big source of revenue. So revenue sources, besides products, commodities, came from services and taxes, all came into the company's coffers. From 1773 on, which is the Tea Act, of course, um, the Regulating Act was passed that same year. And this is the beginning of the end, in my opinion, of the East India Company in terms of losing its ultimate sort of absolute sovereignty and authority that at the kind of pinnacle of its height was about in, this, in the 1770s. By the 1800s, early 1800s, there are a series of acts passed, all of which reduced the uh, commercial functions and powers of the company. And basically what happens is the British government takes over. The, the, the British quote Raj, which lasts for a hundred years from the 1850s to 1947, basically is just taken over the East India Company in essence. Now I wanna talk a little bit about uh, mercantilism as a system where the American colonies fit in. As Michael pointed out, uh, by definition, uh, mercantilism is designed to benefit the uh, achievement of wealth of the mother country. And that comes from the mutually beneficial interaction of government and business. Governments can do things like charter monopolies, which enhance uh, the, the wealth of businesses, but at the same time, the wealth of the country. Uh, and so the, the, the very consistent themes across 15, 16, 1700s on, on how this worked, you wanted to to orchestrate a positive balance of trade and payments. And that came from protective tariffs, keep out imports, subsidize local production, have your own Navy, even want a strong domestic agriculture. The modern economics would say countries should pursue their comparative advantage. Like if you're good in one thing, do it and nothing else and trade. And back in this day, you did everything. Uh, and um, you know, we're sort of moving in that direction now. Right. 
I would call this current era a what move mean, towards a sort mean, of new, new, new mercantilism. What do you mean by yeah. that? Well, what I mean by that is that uh, you, you're more and more, well, there are a number of American companies who had um, offshore stuff and it globalized their production. Now they're nearshoring it back to either the U.S. or Mexico. We want to produce more stuff here, less stuff at other places that we you know, supposedly felt comfortable trading with. Free trade is, is, is fine as, as long as it benefits everyone. And of course, it never does benefit everyone. Um, but the, the format for the American colonies was to produce raw, as you noted, produce raw materials and purchase manufactured goods. And that was an important market. So in the bigger scheme of trade in the 15, 16, well, for the colonies, 16, 1700s is that by generating a positive balance of trade and payments in relation to England, meaning a negative balance of trade and payments was a recurrent uh, phenomenon in colonial America. That gave an inflow of, of wealth to, to England, which offset any negatives elsewhere in the broader system. So even though the East India Company didn't benefit directly from trading with, uh, with colonial America, they benefited indirectly and that the system's positive gains allowed them to offset some negatives in other, in other places. Uh, but they didn't really have any direct trade. The reason for that is if it's one of these American history things that everybody remembers. The British had created the Navigation Acts uh, back in the 1660s. All colonial imports were supposed to go through England first. So tea went from the East India Company's sources in China, the stuff that wasn't smuggled by the Dutch, to London, was uh, unloaded, re-exported, paid a tax in England. British citizens had to pay a tax on tea. We weren't the only ones. Then it was re-exported to colonial markets. Now, some of that re-export was in American ships. Some was in, because Americans had a big shipping business. Uh, but the most important aspect of this, of this uh, mercantile relationship was that it uh, long-term benefits for the colonies. It, to the extent that it, to make a comparison, I have, I've taught some economic development classes. America is sort of a developing country in the sense that it relies on raw material products, primarily for export as the main source of its income. Uh, it has uh, increasingly uh, negative balance of trade and payments. You, you can't survive on that in, indefinitely. You have to either have an outflow of money or you have to incur debt. You know, you think of developing countries are always in debt, financial difficulties, because they're exporting primarily raw materials and importing manufactured goods. The math never works in your favor if that's all you do. That was the colonial situation. Well, what could they do about it? Well, they were part of the English, they were part of the British Empire, and they were regulated. The manufactured goods, production of which were restricted by law. Um, so I think there are a lot of constraints that only could have been eliminated through independence. And, you know, in terms of coming up sort of causes the revolution, so uh, the difference between sort of the tax fever of that period versus the uh, um, long run, I would call it the slow suffoca suffocation of the colonies in terms of their economic potential. You know, both of those play off each other. They're not mutually exclusive. but um, it's common to think of the revolution as being caused by, you know, tax concerns, no taxation with representation, revolt, or revolts from taxes and so forth. It's a longer term uh, conflict. Now, let me just mention a, a little bit. You tell me, Michael, if I'm, I'm going over too much. Um, the uh, right in the 17th. And we'll turn it over to, to, uh, to, to you, Evan. OK. Um, a couple of things were, were happening in the 1770s that caused East India Company um, some financial difficulties. And it seems odd because they were sort of at the heyday of the wealth that they pulled out of India uh, and, and made so many of their investors uh, rich. Um, William Pitt, who was... Um, in the position of having in the 1760s at the end of the Seven Years War, the job of trying to figure out how to come up with some ways to pay off the debt of the war, 
um, did not want to tax the colonies. He wanted to tax the East India Company, who had millions of uh, millions of pounds of income every year available, what it had for years there, a couple of decades. Um, and uh, so he, he, uh, he, uh, he, his health failed him, so to speak, and the, and the colonies ended up with Charles Townsend as exchequer, who was a stockholder in the East India Company. And he pushed in the other direction, which is let's just keep the tea tax on. Yeah, the tea tax really was not that much. American colonists paid less than a percentage of their income on taxes and had a higher income per capita than British citizens did in the 1770s. So we were not overtaxed. No, you know, people, it's all relative thing though. And my sense is it's what you think is coming next perhaps is, is a push for motivation for the revolution. Well, it's also so the, far the away. And act. Everybody's armed. You know, you're far away, you're armed, you have your own ships, you've got an unlimited frontier. Literally, no one knew just how big it was. And the idea, yeah. that, you know, you, you could that be that the American experience was, was a vastly different one, I think, you know, that was creating a, a type of person that simply didn't exist elsewhere. There wasn't anybody who was that free, free as it were. Um, and so I think that you know when 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 we're sort of looking at the at the frontier of British commerce, the ancient trade with the East, you know, running now into this entirely new people, raw people uh, living in North America. So you know, I, I think there's a real dynamic there that I think. Uh, Evan is going to tell us about what is what's the next chapter, Evan? Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Um, Bruce, great presentation, and uh, my eyes just lit up when you mentioned the Navigation Acts because the Navigation Acts figure so prominently in the Boston Tea Party story. So, um, I guess what I'll do to start off here is I'll give a, a very brief overview um, of the Tea Party as we lead into the next chapter. Uh, that Mike is referencing here. So I'll go ahead and share my screen real quick here. Hopefully my PowerPoint will work and behave here. Great. Um, so ultimately we are vastly or, or rapidly approaching the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. So this is a great time to have this conversation to figure out how this story from 1773 factors into our modern lives, right? So the Boston Tea Party itself took place on December 16, 1773, and it involved about 100 to 150 men, some were disguised, some not disguised, uh, who boarded three vessels at Griffin's Wharf. They were divided up into three different boarding parties, about 30 to 50 per vessel, and during a three to three and a half hour period destroyed 340 chests of East India Company tea. Most books will say 342. However, looking at those East India Company manifest directly, it's very clear and do the basic arithmetic, uh, it adds up to 340 chests of East India Company tea. Inside those tea chests was loose leaf tea, not the famous brick tea you might have also heard, but loose leaf tea only involved in the Boston Tea Party. And those Sons of Liberty threw those chests into what was remaining of the water of Boston Harbor, but it happened to be low tide that night, a king's low tide. So it was more mud and puddles than it was your typical ocean uh, or typical harbor. And that evening, the Sons of Liberty destroyed approximately 92,616 pounds of tea in weight. That's roughly 46 tons. And it was valued at about 1.5 million in today's modern currency. Now, this event was, of course, the first significant act of defiance uh, struck by the American colonists. And the impact of the Tea Party was enormous. It led directly to the Intolerable Acts in 1774, a principal development leading to the actions at Lexington and Concord in 75, and of course, the outbreak of the Greater American Revolution. Of the people that were involved in the events and who are known anyway, um, there were a lot, a, a wide variety of ages, honestly. Um, only a few were over the age of 40. And there were a huge amount of people that were under the age of 40 and 16 of those roughly 100 to 150 individuals, um, they were teenagers. So uh, really amazing to think about how important this event was and, and who perpetrated it. 
So why did the Tea Party itself happen? Well, these colonists were, of course, frustrated by that East India Company that Bruce was just talking about, specifically the monopoly on the sale of tea. Uh, this monopoly was created by the Tea Act of 1773. Earlier that year, East India shares would plunge on the London Stock Exchange and boycotts and mismanagement had nearly bankrupted the company, leaving nearly 17 million pounds of tea spilling out into London warehouses. The company also owed a debt, approximately 1.3 million to the British Treasury. And so Parliament restructured the company under a series of laws in hopes of bailing out the East India Company. And while yes, there was a tax of three pence per pound on the tea, as Bruce just said, it was a very minor tax. It was paltry at best and would have largely been no significant financial hardship for the colonists in Boston. In fact, the tea being shipped by the East India Company was duty free, meaning it was actually cheaper than ever. And England hoped that this would increase profits for the struggling East India Company. And throughout all of this, the American colonists, of course, had no representation in Parliament acting on their behalf. And so the revenue from this tea act was supposed to go to pay the salaries of unelected officials appointed by the crown. And this very well-known taxation without representation would of course prove to be a, a key motivator for the Sons of Liberty. and was a point of protest and consternation for many living in Boston and the American colonies as a whole. So how does this Boston Tea Party relate to New Bedford and the New Bedford Whaling Museum? Well. As uh, Mike said earlier, we look at everything through the prism of the sea, right? There were three ships involved in the Boston Tea Party, the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, and the Brig Beaver. Uh, three vessels whose fate would forever be tied together and deeply connected to one of the most important moments in American history. Ships like the Dartmouth, Eleanor, and Beaver were critically important to the British Empire for both economic and patriotic reasons. They were seen as symbols of strength and glory of a nation and vessels like the ones involved in the Boston Tea Party were of course the backbone of trade in the 18th century. They had that significant role in driving a nation's economy um, and they were the way that goods were transported on a global scale. Our master ship right here at the museum says to consider these vessels the 18 wheelers of the 18th century. The world moved forward because of the cargo that these vessels transported around it. And so one of the biggest myths about these vessels is that they were quote unquote British ships. And I suppose, yes, they were as, as though they were part of the British colonies. However, all of the ships involved in the Boston Tea Party were Yankee built. They were built by American colonists here in the American colonies and for the most part captained and crewed by American colonists. Now the Dartmouth, is the ship that we're going to be talking about tonight and it really is the important part of the boston tea party story because its timeline becomes the timeline of the entire boston tea party saga due to the navigation acts that bruce was talking about a few minutes ago the dartmouth was built in 1767 in bedford village um, which is of course now new bedford massachusetts and it was built as a cargo carrying workhorse for the whaling industry she was the first vessel to be constructed in this community and she was captained by James Hall and she carried 114 chests of tea to Boston in 1773. So fully rigged ships such as the Dartmouth would probably not have typically engaged in the act of whaling, rather they would serve as um, cargo support vessels, let's say, often transporting huge amounts of whale oil to ports like Boston or London. And the Dartmouth would often transport barrels of whale oil from Nantucket Island to London, England. All told, she was about uh, 80 feet on deck and about 116 feet overall. And I actually have a clip here of the model, which is on display at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Um, she had a keel of 63 feet long and a beam of 23 feet, six inches. And her rigging towered 75 feet above the waterline and fully loaded, she weighed approximately 250 earthen tons. Um, and like I said, that uh, model that's on display at your museum is spectacular. Uh, my understanding is it was created by Richard Glanville. Um, and it's one of my favorite pieces you have at the museum. Every time I come, it's the first thing I go to and take a picture standing beside 
Well, you know, um, you know, it's not it's not easy coming up with uh, with with the dimensions and the and the lines of of colonial vessels. I mean, that's 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 not an easy thing to do. You sort of have to. Uh, there's no plans for these things. Um, you, you sort of have to go by by registered tonnage, and then you talk to people like you know like the model builders or like uh, Leon Poindexter or other you know extremely knowledgeable shipwrights and shipbuilders and uh, who who can then extrapolate. Right. You know exactly. Largely extrapolate. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean those numbers that I talked about a few minutes ago, they're largely from you know comparable vessels, and we can really make a good educated guess as to what her tonnage was and what, and based on that, we can pretty much figure out her size. And we are hoping to recreate her here at the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. We were hoping to do it in time for the 250th anniversary, but you know, COVID happened and everything that went along with that. And so we missed that window, but we're hoping to recreate her um, hopefully in the next couple of years. Um, you know, talking about those lines and that footage or tonnage and everything, you know, one of the unique features of the Dartmouth was actually her draft. It was nine feet. And, uh, you know, for our audience, the shift's draft is the distance between the waterline and the keel. And so often uh, vessels dimension would be constructed with their home ports in mind, creating unique dimensions for each ship. And so because the Dartmouth's home port was the island of Nantucket, just off of Nantucket, there is a sandbar of approximately nine feet. And so the Dartmouth was constructed to be able to sail over that sandbar to be able to get into her safe harbor uh, in Nantucket. Now, also most importantly for New Bedford's history, the Dartmouth was owned by Francis Roach a member of the famous Roach family of Nantucket, definitely with New Bedford connections as well. Uh, Francis was the third son of Joseph Roach, the patriarch of the family. Uh, Joseph had a reputation for being a fair and honest businessman, and his family owned a fleet of approximately 15 vessels, and they controlled and handled every aspect of their whaling industry. They hired the crews and captains, they scheduled their voyages, did their own accounting, uh, assessed monetary exchange rates, graded the whale oil, you name it, they did it uh, for, for their vessels. And Francis, unfortunately, found himself in a very unenviable position. He was stuck in the middle of tense negotiations between the tea consignees in Boston, the town selectmen, and the Sons of Liberty, who were doing the best that they could to send these vessels back to England with the tea on board, or at the very least, prevent the landing of the tea. So Francis Roach was summoned multiple times before the meeting of the body of the people that began at Faneuil Hall, but eventually moved to historic Old South Meeting House. And during those meetings, he was repeatedly sent to Royal Governor Thomas Hutchinson to plead for his, his vessel, the Dartmouth, to be sent back to England with that tea on board. But of course, each time he went, his request was refused. So we fast forward to the evening of December 16th, and it was Roach himself that delivered the news to the townspeople of Boston that the tea was to be unloaded as the law demanded. And Old South Meeting House was packed with over 5,000 people leaning on his every word. He felt intimidated, he felt threatened, and it actually took uh, several people to stand up to tell the crowd, hey, let's not uh, hurt Francis Roach here. He's done everything that we asked. So the environment inside Old South that night was literally that intimidating. And when he delivered this news, Old South Meeting House erupted in a cacophony of sound. There's a, a great anecdote. Uh, there was a merchant who lived just up the road from Old South who was a Tory, so he wasn't inside the building that night. Um, and he said that when Francis Rhodes delivered the news, uh, the building shook so much that you'd thought the inhabitants of the infernal regions had broken loose. So <laughs> just think about you know the, the emotion uh, in that building. And so... Francis found himself in this position because it was his ship, the Dartmouth, that was the first to arrive carrying 114 chests of tea on November 28th, 1773. And her arrival and the impending importation of that cargo, that's what set off the 20 day standoff and the buildup of tension and animosity that would ultimately culminate in the tea's destruction. The Navigation Acts were what set that 20 day timeline from when a vessel entered port and then the cargo had to be offloaded and the duties or taxes paid on that. So really quick, you know, the Dartmouth arrives in port, 
and she's moved first to Rose Wharf, which is very near to Griffin's Wharf. And then ultimately uh, she moves on to Griffin's Wharf for her date with Destiny. Um, and so ultimately the Dartmouth, as I said, is what really kind of sets everything in motion um, and really gets the Boston Tea Party started. Now, following the Tea Party, the Dartmouth itself set sail in January of 74 with a cargo of whale oil. And on board was Francis Roach again, who was summoned by Lord Dartmouth along with the vessel's captain to Whitehall to give testimony regarding the destruction of the tea. Um, but on the journey back from London, the Dartmouth foundered. And the crew had to be rescued by Timothy Folger and Shoebell Coffin of Nantucket. And they were eventually brought back to Boston in November of 1774. Um, so that said, let's talk a little bit now. Um, and here's a, actually a, a nice shot of where Griffin's Wharf was as compared to Rose Wharf here. Um, if we've got some time, I know we're, we're approaching uh, the end of my section as well. I definitely want to talk a bit about uh, the 250th anniversary coming up. Um, you know, it's right around the corner. Uh, it's in December of this year, obviously, uh, no pressure. Uh, I can't believe it's already May. We, we've been focusing on this event uh, for quite a while, and it's pretty much been the singular focus of our organization uh, for the better part of this year. And our hope here is to create a programmatic year, a commemorative year, um, featuring the work of many different organizations, the New Bedford Whaling Museum being one of them. And all of the program is gonna be featured on all things Boston Tea Party, of course. And so this commemorative year will feature special exhibits, talks, speaker series, like what we're doing today and what we're gonna be doing next week uh, at the museum. And it will culminate in the grand scale reenactment of the Boston Tea Party on December 16th, uh, 2023. Uh, we are of course working hand in hand with multiple organizations, especially Revolution 250, um, to create this commemorative year with special exhibits and performances. And hopefully and programmatically, our goals are to bring an international awareness to the Boston's Tea Party role in the lead up to the American Revolution. And we'll do that by creating dynamic, inclusive and collaborative programming to encourage public education, conversation and engagement. We're also trying really hard to work with the school systems, both locally and nationally. And of course, work with travel and tourism partners to encourage people to come to Massachusetts to celebrate this important moment in American history. So uh, real quick, I can go through some of our signature programs here. And Mike, again, just stop me if you need me to, uh, to hop in or, or change the topic at all. But we have been traveling all around the country over the last year or so, uh, placing commemorative markers at the graves of known Boston Tea Party participants. Um, our grave marker project is in partnership with Revolution 250. Um, we actually just yesterday, last evening, got off a plane from Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, we spent a few days in Dearborn Heights, Michigan, uh, Bainbridge, Ohio, and Cincinnati, placing these commemorative markers at the headstones of known Boston Tea Party participants. Uh, next month, we'll be traveling to upstate New York and also Northern Pennsylvania. And then we'll be wrapping up the program by hopping on a plane and flying over to Kilkenny, Ireland, uh, London, England, to do an event in London with the East India Company, the same one that Bruce was talking about a few minutes ago. And then uh, we're also going to Paris, France to place a marker for Boston Tea Party participant, James Swan, which is gonna be very exciting for us. And this is a great opportunity for us to remind the world that the Boston Tea Party does not belong to Boston. It belongs to all of us because these participants spread out around the globe and brought this history with them to wherever they traveled. Another exciting endeavor of ours is the creation of the Boston Tea Party Descendancy Program which is a new lineage society whose members will be made up of descendants of Tea Party participants. And we're linking these participants on a global scale. And this is in partnership with the New England Historic Genealogical Society or American Ancestors as well. This commemorative year also affords us an amazing opportunity um, to talk about underrepresented voices in the story of the American Revolution. What is an incredible um, coincidence, I suppose, is that on board the vessel Dartmouth, the vessel built in New Bedford was the books, the first edition of Phyllis Wheatley's book of poetry. Phyllis Wheatley is the first uh, enslaved person, uh, the first woman of African descent and the third woman in American history to have a book of poetry published. And her books were on board the Dartmouth in the hold next to the tea chest. And that's just amazing. Luckily, her, her books weren't destroyed 
All the other cargo was removed from the vessels except for the tea. So it was just the tea that was damaged that evening. And so we will be working with a local photographer named Valerie Anselme of Anselme Photography and uh, recreating uh, the famous frontispiece uh, of Phyllis Wheatley's books. And we'll be displaying that in downtown Boston. And you can see some of other uh, Valerie's work here on your screen now. Also, we are gonna be reaching out to schools across the Commonwealth uh, with the main themes, the Boston Tea Party story, protest, representation, civic engagement and commemoration. And we're encouraging students to draw, paint, uh, sculpt, write, create video content, all of that and we'll upload that to a free virtual exhibit at bostonteaparty250.org. So any teachers that are listening today, go to that website, submit your students' material, and we'll share that around the world. We're really excited about all that. Um, and all of this stuff, the commemorative year, will culminate in the grand scale reenactment of the Boston Tea Party on December 16th, 2023. This is a full scale dramatic recreation of what happened that evening including a reenactment of the meeting of the bodies of the people, both at Faneuil Hall and Old South Meeting House, a parade of many thousands of people through the streets of Boston, down to the waterfront where we will throw East India Company tea into Boston Harbor yet again. The East India Company is donating 250 pounds of tea. Are in you honor serious? Of they are, yes. No. Uh, in, honor, <laughs> in honor of the 250th anniversary. And so we're filling up the tea chest with the East India Company tea and throwing it in the harbor. Is this the real East India Company or the one that Bruce was talking about, the made up one? The one that Bruce was talking about. Uh, they're they're trying really hard to. Uh, I can't you know, imagine to... the East India Company would actually give tea to be thrown in the harbor again, unless <laughs> it was this this front company that Bruce is talking about. Sure. So yeah. Oh well, it's, it's an Indian entrepreneur who's running the business now. So hard, it's a well. you know an, a nice a nice irony there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, we we'll, we need the tea and we'll take it. And uh, also anyone listening out there today, if you mail our museum tea, uh, we will also put it into the tea chest and we'll send you a certificate uh, saying that your tea was involved in the 250th anniversary. Yeah, that's a pretty and reenactment. Cool thing. Yeah, it's pretty great. Uh, we're also, we're having a trolley that will uh, travel all around the state uh, to various local fairs and festivals and stuff. And you can bring loose leaf tea and you can put it in a giant tea chest at the trolley and we'll save that, we'll give you a certificate and your tea can be thrown into Boston Harbor that night as well. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a real like full scale dramatic recreation involving hundreds of reenactors. And we're expecting about 10 to 15,000 people to be down in Boston uh, that evening at all the various locations and especially along the waterfront to watch you know, the grand finale of this commemorative year. Ultimately, to summarize, we're looking at this anniversary as a combination of various spheres of influence. Um, obviously, the historical community, great museums like the New Bedford Whaling Museum, our other partners like Mass Historical Society, Revolution 250, Revolutionary Spaces, um, any historical organization, organization that wants to be involved, we'll work with. Also, the hospitality community. We want Boston and Massachusetts to really have a, a lot of business in December and have people come throughout the entire commemorative year to learn about our region's great history and be a part of all this, as well as the travel and tourism community. So we're really encouraging people to come to partner with all these great organizations and to really learn the importance of the Boston Tea Party and what it means in a modern context. And so ultimately, if I've got time for it, like I do have a very brief video that will, uh, that will kind of show the, the overall commemorative year. Do we have time for that? How brief is brief? Uh, about two minutes. Great. All right, let's do it. Boston, a city upon a hill a city of history and innovation, a city of culture, art, and tradition, a city of champions, legends, and revolutionaries, a diverse city of courage, compassion, and strength. Around every corner, there are echoes of the past, from the cobblestone streets 
to the historic buildings. Standing the test of time, reminding us of where we've been and where we still need to go. History happens here. This history is complicated and complex. Telling the stories of our past informs our present and guides us all to a better future. In 1773, scores of colonists boarded three ships and risked everything to defy a tyrannical government. A moment that went far beyond tea and taxation. A moment defined by one's right to protest, representation in one's own government, being treated fairly, and about ordinary citizens doing extraordinary things. The Boston Tea Party. A moment that sent America down the road to revolution. In 2023, Boston will commemorate the 250th anniversary of this iconic moment that forever changed the course of American history through a year of public engagement, dynamic programming, exhibits, special events, installations, and performances where audiences can explore the many layers of Boston's Tea Party story. The year of commemorations will feature unprecedented levels of collaboration between organizations across Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, including museums, schools, historical organizations, as well as Boston's arts, tourism, and hospitality industries. This commemorative year will culminate in the grand-scale reenactment of the Boston Tea Party on the 250th anniversary, December 16th, 2023. This world-class public event will take place at the very locations where the Boston Tea Party occurred two and a half centuries before. History happens here, and will happen here again. Be part of that history in 2023, and commemorate Boston's Tea Party legacy as an inspiration to generations of people around the world. Be history. Be here. Be Boston. So yeah, I hope everyone can come to Boston and be a part of it. And we look forward to working with all these great organizations, especially the Bedford Whaling Museum. Well, I mean, it's quite the quite the event. That's quite the event, isn't it? I mean, uh, yeah, we, you know, the you can't get past the the role of of. Uh, the role of major merchants in, in American seaports, the role of people like the roaches, the you know the place of, of you know, whaling in the in the colonial economy, um, you know, which was really significant, uh, significant in fact for the British uh, economy as well. I mean, it had there were ramifications, there were political ramifications, or uh, you know, that American oil was in competition with with uh, British oil and you know the in the 17th century the British British whale fishery just they shot themselves in the foot you know uh, uh, and they couldn't get out of their own way and and, and successfully uh, operate a, an Arctic whale fishery you know and the Dutch followed in the path of you know what Bruce was talking about and what the you know the American um, <clears throat> what the American model would be and that was individual voyages were managed by owners and investors. Hmm. This wasn't a, this wasn't some joint stock company, um, uh, and and the British you know whale fishery was subsidized, uh, and it it never really worked. And so you know the the importance of of you know of places like Bedford Village and Nantucket and Newport and and uh, you know uh, New London you know, to Boston, to, uh, to, to shipping American commodities to England and, and taking in, in, and shipping the goods back is really, really, it's, it's significant. It's important. It's, it's, it hinges. It's the maritime experience. It's the story. So this is great. Um, no, no two ways about it. We have, um, we have a couple of questions here. Alan, uh, let's see, Alan, Alan Wyman points out that, um, uh, that there were other insurrections uh, 
uh, there was uh, apparently another uh, another affair, tea affair in 1774, as well as as uh, parallel um, affairs elsewhere in the colonies. And then Allen asks, did the colonists really want representation in parliament? Um, I think we do have to be careful about when we talk about the colonists, because there are many different kinds of colonists. Some were uh, rep some were loyalists, you know. But what do you what do you fellows think? Yeah, well, I mean, I can definitely. Well, it's always. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, it's it's easy to forget that uh, in at the on the eve of the revolution, only about one third of the Americans, if I remember this from my from before, one third of the people were at adamantly in favor of the revolution, about one third were loyalists and about one third were neutral. Uh, so, you know, that's maybe that's why it took as long as it did for War of Independence to finish up. But, uh, you know, that's that's an interesting challenge. I was going to say, I was just add one thing, uh, uh, because the Tea Party is the focus that been brought up of, uh, of, the, of the in the commemoration. One of the aspects of the Tea Act, besides the fact that the East India Company was bringing tea, was the difference that it created uh, for, for American merchants. Because they were going to be able to sell tea directly in the colonies through their own agents. And it wasn't just tea that they sold. They had all sorts of other commodities. And the potential for a huge loss of colonial income from the wholesale and retailing of these commodities was a big factor, I think, in support, broader support for the uh, the non-importation uh, boycotts that occurred after each of these crises. And uh, to the uh, sort of ironic, uh, I was in uh, India in in uh, 2012, and just coincidentally, the time that I was there, there were protests in the streets in Delhi because the government was considering allowing Walmart to get a foothold in India. That did not go over very well, but it's basically the same thing as the East India Company taking over in the colonies, the threat of that, right. pushing out the merchants. So yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing economic battle that played out in that period. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, and, and I'll add, you know, with the, with the question of, about the other tea parties, um, Alan's absolutely right. You know, there were multiple follow up or aftershocks, if you will, from the Boston Tea Party. And so anywhere this tea went, you know, it went to Philadelphia as well, New York, um, South Carolina, there were similar events. Although, in, in yes, Alan is right in his question as well, maybe not just as radical. You know, some of those communities actually were successful in sending the tea back to England and never even unloaded it. Others uh, unloaded it in a more peaceful way and locked it away in warehouses and things like that. But all around Massachusetts, there were ceremonial tea burnings. So any tea that, uh, obviously the Boston Tea Party tea didn't make it in town, that was all destroyed. But any other tea from that area, uh, there were a lot of ceremonial burnings of it, brought to town commons and town squares, and um, you know they they lit it on fire to make sure that, as they said, not one leaf uh, would be would survive. Uh, they were mostly uh, successful in, in those efforts, but some tea made it through. Yeah. So the river, I mean, there was plenty of of incidents of of you know British soldiers being quartered, uh, and you know really sort of. Um, personal kind of, of infringements, but the American Revolution was largely economically structured. Would you would you agree with that, Bruce? Say that again. Large, the, what? The, the, Ameri the American Revolution was largely economical. I mean, that there were some there were some personal infringements as far as you know the quartering of soldiers in in people's homes, uh, but you know the the howling about freedom is economic freedom. Yeah, it's in. There's an, the uh, restrictions on what could and couldn't be done in the colonies uh, were pretty significant. And one of the things that happened in the, in the, the 17, you know, seven years war period up until the revolution was these these the things that were the you know, the Navigation Act vocabulary here is enumerated items. 
uh, was that's the term they use in innovation. Things that could only go to England. Well, that list got bigger. And got keep getting added on, added on, and uh, uh, eventually in 1766, everything that was not an enumerated item became an enumerated item. So the it's the writings on the wall. Things are getting worse economically in terms of being constrained. And then another thing that happened in 1774 um, was the western edge of colonial America had access to a lot of open land. Uh, they had, Virginia had claims that went all the way to the Pacific coast. Uh, but those claims were invalidated by the British in the Quebec Act of 1774. So all that territory, all that land, for land speculation, for hunting, for furs, and so forth, is all out of, no, no longer accessible to the Americans. So a lot of potential gains could only come from becoming independent. That's, to me, you're right. The economic freedoms uh, were only going to come from it complete independence from England. Yeah. So we have a couple of quick questions. We have a couple of questions and we're going to have to wrap up the program. Um, one of our regulars, Bob, uh, Bob Demanch, uh, is curious about what other colonial ports um, were dealing with the imports of tea uh, and if there was any sort of general national reaction um, uh, to the to the affair of the tea. Um, and uh, and then um, and then Sarah Lowe uh, raises the point of the Gaspé incident, which is really really important incident. Um, you know, you talk about violent. I mean, that was you know that was not the Boston Tea Party. That was those were those were Rhode Island merchants who you know violently uh, attacking and destroying a a um, a um, revenue cutter essentially. It was a revenue cutter essentially in their right. um, so. Uh, uh, but what about this? What about Bob's question about these uh, about other, you know, reactions to the Tea Party and other uh, other colonial ports? Yeah, sure. So the, the tea definitely went to New York, uh, Pennsylvania and South Carolina right around this time as well. There was actually a fourth ship that was sent to Massachusetts, the William, but she never made it. She ran aground off of uh, Provincetown off on Cape Cod. Um, that tea was actually salvaged um, by the family of the tea consignees, and it was stored away in a warehouse for, for a long time. Uh, and ironically, we sold that to pay for the war effort and all that stuff. But anyway, uh, that's a totally different webinar for a different day. Um, but the reaction to the Tea Party was quite mixed, to be honest. You know, you look at it through the uh, Americana prism, and you assume that everyone loved what happened on Griffin's Wharf on December 16, 1773. And sure, it was universally seen as a positive thing. I mean, even John Adams would call it the most magnificent movement of all. He called it a majestic thing. Um, and he said that it was an apaca in history. So clearly um, they, they did something that resonated with the general populace. Um, however, there were other people that looked at this you know, in horror because they felt that the Sons of Liberty had really crossed a line. Ironically, I think they crossed more of a line, you know, during the Stamp Act riots and tearing down people's homes and beating people up. At least this was largely a peaceful endeavor, although you could argue that back and forth about the lead up to the Tea Party being peaceful or not. But there were a lot of people that saw this as a bridge too far and that um, this would lead to much more painful events in Boston. And they were quite prophetic. I mean, this led directly to the Port Bill the closure of Boston um, and effectively, you know, the removal of, of the capital of Massachusetts being changed from Boston to Salem and basically this, this blockade of the town. And for the next several years, all the way up to the evacuation of the British, Boston suffered. Um, and so people like Benjamin Franklin initially were dead set against what the Sons of Liberty did in 1773. I don't think George Washington himself was overly uh, in favor of, of the event. Um, so you can look at it from two perspectives, you know, but what we can, you know, look at now historically is that this was one of the most important events along the road to American independence, the revolution, and no matter which way you look at it, it really was that, you know, uh, that event that kind of catapulted America down the road to revolution. You agree with that, Bruce? 
Yeah, I don't have uh, the the. Evan has the expertise on the uh, the uh, the different uh, ports in America that were receiving tea at the time. I only remember I think four: uh, Philadelphia, New York, uh, Boston, and Charleston. Um, but I'm sure there was more. So I don't have any additional thing to add on that. And so, uh, John, Be our last question of the evening, and then we'll say goodnight. John Behrens wants to know why was Charles II's wife such a devotee of tea, and what did she do to promote it? So, where did, where did, is that Catherine well, of Aragon? Who is that, Catherine of Aragon? Yeah. What was her story? Now, it's Catherine, it's something like Barbanski, Barbanski or oh. I mean, it's not Polish, but uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a po the Portuguese uh, um, names are sometimes difficult to produce pronounce excuse uh, me so they uh she she married charles ii in 1660 something like that anyway portugal is the uh i i had an opportunity to go to portugal last fall portugal is they're they're very uh uh you know they have their own history that they're proud of and their maritime history is amazing and they were out in the in the indies and they were the forerunners of of these Dutch and English uh, companies. They were out. They, they, they traded. Thank you. They traded with uh, the different areas in the Indies before the other these other uh, major powers did. So, tea was already something that Portuguese uh, was part, was increasingly part of their culture earlier than than the English. And she just brought that over, and it became. Uh, it was not. You know, it was a, at one point. Eventually, it was cheaper than beer. So. Um, it became more widely <laughs> a drink in England, but she she pushed the culture a little bit from her Portuguese heritage. Yeah, it's something to do with her dowry. I, 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 uh, I've got this copy of this. It's a pretty good book, uh, uh, John. Yeah, her her dowry her dowry included an area in India, which I think was Bombay. Right. Um, so how about that for a dowry uh, component? There you go, Bombay. I'll give you part of India. So she gets tea and the rest. If you marry my daughter. <laughs> well, I can't say yeah. uh, thank you enough, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, who uh, you know, uh, who come out, you know, for these local history guild. It was a good one, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bruce, for for agreeing. Uh, you know, on such short notice, and uh, it was just you know, great insights and always exciting and to, you know, mentally engaged to get engaged with history. It's great stuff. Evan, thank you so much. And yeah. we'll hearing more from you like shortly, right? Yeah. Next week on the 18th, we'll be there. We'll be doing an in-person presentation, half the historical talk about the tea party and half a theatrical performance. And we'll be uh, going on board the Lagoda. So we're looking forward to that. Fantastic. You know, uh, it's the awkward, it's, a, it's the awkward part of the evening where you have to like hit the leave button and then we just disappear. So uh, <laughs> thanks again. It's great seeing you, great All right. seeing you, Bruce, and we'll see you around. Thank you. I enjoyed it. It was it was fun. Call me back. Okay. Same here. <laughs> see ya. Bye bye.